Welcome to Trending in Education. Mike Palmer here. Excited today to be joined by a couple of folks from a company called Med School Coach. Clara Gillen and Sam Smith are here with me today. Clara and Sam, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks, Mike. That was Sam's voice you heard first and Clara's second. Sam's voice is also out there reverberating in headphones and earbuds everywhere. He is the voice of the MCAT Basics podcast. Clara has been driving the product development for med school coaches' products. All of this is very much powered by what you're listening to right now, which is audio. Sam, can you catch us up on who you are, your origin story, how you got to this point in the conversation? And for our listeners, if you haven't inferred it yet, we're going to be talking a lot about the power of audio while you're listening to this podcast. So it may get a little meta at times. Just <laughs> please roll with us. We're, we think it'll be an interesting conversation. But Sam, can you catch us up on what got you to this point in your professional life? Yeah, yeah. First of all, I'm, I'm a medical student. And back when I was studying for the MCAT, which is the entrance exam for med school, I think, what was it, 2018, I believe? I was at the time kind of biking back and forth to work. And I was working in a lab and I was doing some kind of monotonous pipetting back and forth, as many pre-meds end up doing for free because we'll do anything for free. And I always had this idea of like, why is there not an audio a podcast or some kind of resource I can use to study for the MCAT while I'm doing these monotonous things, mm -hmm. like work pipetting, et cetera. And there was a few resources out there, but I was not very impressed with them. And so I decided to start this podcast after I got done studying for the MCAT. It's called MCAT Basics. And you know, I was recording in my garage and it grew over time and people I think really liked it. And I think it, it helped some people. And uh, yeah, it just grew to be pretty big and a lot bigger than I ever expected. And so, yeah, and now we're working on a, a product and Claire can tell you more about that. But now I'm, I'm excited to uh, keep working on it and uh, recording audio uh, content. Yeah. And we'll want to get back into some of the, the nuance of the power of audio in a bit. But Clara, yeah, let's pick up with you. What got you to this point in your professional life? What what you got going on? Yeah, so I'm in a different boat from Sam. I never went to med school. I was pre-med. So back in you know the early 2010s, I was a pre-med student in California and went through all of the typical pre-med things, took the MCAT, and then started tutoring. And then from there, I just went the tutoring route and decided, oh, med school it's not for me, it's difficult and expensive, et cetera. I just fell in love with teaching. And from there, ended up working at the product departments of a variety of mostly MCAT focused companies, yep. some other test prep. And, and so I think it's important for pre-meds to be to some degree taught by other pre-meds. Empathy is important. And I definitely feel for all the pre-meds out there who are going through the beast that is MCAT prep and yeah. med admissions. Not, not to mention the other beast that is the pandemic. People are pipetting through the pandemic, I guess is my point. <laughs> and then while you're doing the, those types of tasks, I, I've frequently thought the same thing as somebody who's, we started this podcast back in 2016. I've been an avid podcast listener since probably the mid aughts. Are we allowed to call them the aughts? I'm going to, the mid aughts. The idea that audio can fit into pretty much any aspect of your life is something that I've been thinking about since I started listening, you know, mid, mid to early 2000s. And it's been 15 years now that I've been regularly listening to a lot of audio. And I found that when I need to do it and when I need to get a lot of information in, it's really effective. Not to mention, aside from the portability and the flexibility of it, there's also the variable speed component and a lot of other elements that make it both very simple to use, but also really information rich and flexible, portable. I'd love to hear each of you share some of your perspective on, on the power of, of educational audio. And, and then I want to get into some other elements of the delivery side of audio around micro learning and instructional design and learning science, those kinds of things, but more just as a consumer and someone who's thinking about how you get information into people's minds. Maybe beginning with you, Clara, and then we can pick up with Sam. Yeah, I think audio has a, a ton of strengths, some of which you mentioned. And I think it's really interesting because in MCAT in particular, video has always been like the predominant mode or, or books, but every company has its own video course and that sort of thing. So I think one of the big strengths of audio, in addition to the flexibility and the portability, is just this ability to 
hear the material portrayed in a way that doesn't rely on visuals, mm. right? Because these students have looked at books for their whole lives. They know what a book about the Doppler effect or a video about the Doppler effect looks like. Um, and now here comes Sam and he has to explain it in a way that doesn't rely on like, a drawing of waves. And because of that, it's different. It's a different modality. It's a different description. And we find that it helps it stick mm. uh, a lot better than, you know, making our own version of a video about the, the same thing that everyone else is doing. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, I think that's something I didn't even think about. But yeah, that, that, that is very true, right? When you don't have a visual in front of you and you're trying to describe, I don't know, acceleration or linear motion, it, 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 you describe it differently than you would with the visuals. So that's a good point. And Mike, I'll add to that. I'm kind of like you. I, I'm, if I'm doing something that I don't have to be completely present for, I'm listening to a podcast. Yeah. I'm listening to, you know, Freakonomics, NPR, New York Times, whatever it is, I'm, I'm always listening to a podcast. So I started loving it there. But I think, as you mentioned, the nice thing about audio is you can be doing it any time, right? You can be doing the dishes and you can just be listening to these different segments and, and hopefully picking something up. And that's something we can get into too is, you know, we kind of geared these audio segments in the product to be pretty short. Mm -hmm. And part of the reason we do that is because maybe you only have five, 10 minutes to listen to something real quick. You could be studying for the MCAM those five or five to 10 minutes, which is pretty helpful. Yeah. I like both those answers and I'm trying to figure out which one to go after first, maybe just starting with what you were talking about, because I do want to get into micro learning more maybe next, but before we get there, I think the imaginative aspect of listening or reading, I guess, are, are similar in that if you're not provided the visual stimuli, it is more of an active exercise for the listener in this case to actually do something. Check out the Harlow's Monkeys one for those of you <laughs> who are, are foraging. It is a, a real opportunity for you to be in more of an imaginative space, which I do think probably deepens the processing for those who can do it best. Uh, and then maybe after we talk about micro learning, the other element that I think is interesting is when you do have the affordance of your eyes, what can you do to supplement what's coming in through your ears, or as I like to refer to them through your learn holes. Any thoughts on it real quick on that, Clary, you know, cause you made that comment and I think both Sam and I were, were thinking, Hmm, interesting, but any, anything further on that before we get into micro learning? Yeah, sure. It's really interesting, I think, because when people hear audio or they hear like, you know, I'm listening to, I don't know, music or a playlist or a podcast or something, I think people think of it sometimes as passive, like passive learning. And of course, you know, active learning is generally going to be preferable to passive learning and help you encode information better and all of that. And I actually think that this form of like audio course can be very active depending on how the listener engages with it. So we always do try to encourage our listeners to Think about it, you know, paint the picture in their head in a sense. And then that can be even preferable to a lot of these other companies out there, which are trying to give you the picture. Mm -hmm. They're like, here, memorize this. Here is the picture you should memorize. But we're like, mm -hmm. no, make your own. Right. Yeah. And later on, we're, we're going to talk about virtual reality too, because that obviously, <laughs> what else are we going to do? But Sam, the micro element that you were talking about is really interesting. And that was something that struck me when I was listening to a couple of your, your short form podcast episodes, you know, they're maybe like three to five, three to seven minutes long, something like mm -hmm. that. And it felt like it was just enough time to, to get the information in there. And it made me also want to kind of knock out more, almost get into, you know, you were mentioning the gym, but almost like do my reps through a playlist or through a series of these. And, and a lot of that I think is unlocked by the fact that you were able to go micro. Can you expand on that a little bit? Cause, cause it did seem when I started listening to it, it did make me think that these are digestible and I can knock them out in these little moments yeah. when I have, have a little bit of time. Yeah. So a lot of the podcast episodes are like an hour long. Mm -hmm. Um, and we were, when we were making this MCAT go product, one of the things we did is break down a lot of the information into smaller bins and then create audio segments based on those smaller bins. And yeah, I think there's a lot of advantages to that, which is you, you have not a lot of time to listen to something. You can listen to one or two, take 10 minutes of your time. Another big thing is, you, you know, I think some students might be deficient in a very particular area and might want to pick out three specific ones to listen to a bunch of times over and get their repetition in. So that's another advantage. And then like you mentioned, I think what students will end up doing is putting together playlists and just combining all the audio lessons that they just, you know, don't feel very good about mm -hmm. and listening to that playlist a bunch of times. I think for 
this product, the short form definitely has some advantages over the long form. Yeah. Yeah. And I imagine also from a product design perspective, like it's better architecture if you can put together different playlists from the same content foundation, because the sequencing and the order in which you take stuff in is really important and frequently higher level insights and perspectives can be drawn by cutting it two different ways. So you could listen to chemistry, a microbiology lesson in one context, and then pull it up again in a very different context. Frequently, that's what's tested on the MCAT. And that's what good doctors have to be able to do is not just know the micro element, but also understand how you can connect it across to different elements of your knowledge set, just medical knowledge in general. I, I am so glad that you said that. A lot of MCAT students starting out actually, I think, don't understand that, that need for this higher level understanding of like overlap between topics and different contexts. But that is one of the key features of th this product is, of course, every course has the order that students typically go through the course, but this ability to create playlists, like we can create them and the student can create their own. Let's us, let's say we have lab techniques in biochemistry and organic chemistry and biology, you know, we can make a playlist with just those techniques and then students can see the overlap and how really all techniques are based on the same sort of fundamental chemical principles. Um, so that's a huge advantage, I would say, and certainly not one that we'd be able to have flexibility with if our lessons were like an hour or if our clips were an hour. Yeah. 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 And then what about video? The elephant in the room. I've been quoted actually by myself. No, I've said in the past that audio is the new video. I started saying that maybe five, six years ago half as a joke. And then I increasingly became more and more convinced, but it is very much a counterpoint to the prevailing wisdom. You mentioned it earlier, Clara, you know, everybody needs to put a video course together. The other related thought, but you were touching on this a, a little bit, Sam, too, is the, the universal design for learning aspect of audio, where if you're trying to reach the visually impaired, you need to get the audio right. And frequently folks don't take the time when they're extemporizing a recorded video lesson, which is what a lot of the instructional content winds up being. There isn't always thought to what if someone can't see the graphic, you know, granted a lot of this is catching up and folks are using alt tags and, and they're describing stuff. But I do think from inception, if you're thinking about using audio to deliver something, there's a level of thoughtfulness to the words you're putting together that I think frequently folks can bypass. You touched on this a little bit, Clara, as well, where if you have great visuals, the audio almost becomes less critical. But when you're going audio first or audio as a primary channel, I think there's a level, level of thoughtfulness that has to go into what gets in there. Maybe start with you, Sam, on that. Any, any thoughts? Yeah, no, I think that's a really good point. And I can tell you that in, in creating the podcast, there was many times where I had to sit down and think about like, okay, how do I even present this in an audio way? You know, how am I supposed to describe, you know, these different processes? There's a level of thinking in when it comes to making them. And then I think, yeah, it opens the door for a lot of imagination, right? People can think about things, visualize things in, in ways that they never have before, you know, in their own way, because there, there are so many of these resources that exist, and even in, in med school, where they make the table for you, or they make the document that's got all the diseases, and it's right there before you. And that's how people study. I think in some ways, it's better to, instead of having that list, make the list yourself. Go through, categorize everything. I think you learn a lot better by taking information and kind of putting it together in your own way. And I think that's part of why audio is so good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've always thought as simple as it may be, audio paired with a physical book is a very natural. And, and also you can get comfortable in that context. Moving to you on this, Clara, the context in which folks are studying are, have really been transformed by the pandemic and the ways in which learners are stitching together their experiences are, are all changing. How do you think about this from a product design perspective? You mentioned empathy a bit in your open combination of empathy. It is learning products. So there's learning science, cognitive science, instructional design. It's got to just be a cohesive, sticky learning experience. I always like to pick the brains of, of folks who are thinking about 
designing learning products these days? What factors into your thinking? Yeah, so it's an interesting kind of combination of actually looking at, say, learning science, like memory science, that sort of thing, like space repetition and active learning, where I think we have a little bit of an advantage that we're teaching to MCAT students or science, some science-oriented students is that they actually understand some of that too. And some of this learning science is actually on the MCAT. So we have a little bit of an in, whereas I think a challenge in developing these products is both, you know, developing something that you think will teach most effectively and helping the student understand that it will do that. Mm -hmm. You know, like I, I could make the most active learning oriented product ever. And if students don't want to use it, then it's, it's worthless. So we also thought really intensely about the use cases for this sort of product. And I think it's Absolutely right that you, you mentioned the pandemic um, because we have so many students who live in a busy house or have a big family and don't get a lot of peace and quiet. And I used to always tell those students to go to a public library and sit on the computer there and watch your videos. And for a long time, that was possible during the pandemic. And so now you know, we could be like, oh, go for a walk. Mm -hmm. You could still go for a walk in, in most environments. And I think that this product is much more accessible that way. Um, and then, of course, also hear points about accessibility with the visually impaired, et cetera. And, and we definitely tried to keep that in mind as well as cost. So audio is naturally cheaper to produce than video. Uh, and that way we can pass along those cost savings uh, and have a product that people can actually afford. Yeah, I very much respect the work that Gimlet was able to do, for example, to grow a startup from nothing based on creating compelling audio products and thinking about the design of audio as really an exercise in storytelling and production. And what's interesting about Gimlet is now many other folks are doing this as well, is that they're expanding from audio into video where you can prove the model more cheaply through audio and then add more elements to the production once you've honed it. Sam, are we prepping for MCAT Basics, the movie? Like, what's the <laughs> thoughts on audio as a proving ground uh, uh, and maybe a, a backbone to something that you can then layer other, other media formats and other elements on top of? This is where, and by the way, no, there's no MCAT Basics, the movie. That, that sounds interesting. This is where this MCAT Go product comes from is, you know, we see there's a lot of people that like this audio format. And so this is where we've decided to create this, this product that now features these short audio clips, quizzes as well, that takes it to the next level, so to mm -hmm. speak. Mm -hmm. I like your point about companies that start with audio first, because I think a huge trend in, in product management for, I guess, 20 years at this point has been um, getting a product to market quickly and then continuous iteration, you know, validating the idea. And I think with audio, that's, that's much easier than with video and hiring, you know, a staff of animators and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And so we, I, I mean, we're very certain that there will be places where it's like, okay, a study guide supplement could be helpful in this like very visually oriented area. I actually think there, there are fewer areas of that in the MCAT than people may think, but because we can find those gaps, we can iterate on it. We, we have a lot more flexibility and speed than we would if we were doing cumbersome video process first. Yeah, and, and for those who are less familiar with the MCAT test prep market, you know, it is a place where the, the market goes to the best products out there and it's very difficult to have them consume only and exclusively your stuff. So that's the other element that I, I think is interesting about audio as almost a curatorial format where you can curate for folks. You know, I even, I think in one of the, the lessons I was listening to, Sam, you were saying, you could just find this on Google. And that's a, that's an important reminder too. Lots of times folks feel like they have to custom craft everything themselves when the natural behavior is going to be, if I can, I'm going to have my browser open. And while I'm listening to this, I'm going to be pulling some stuff up as I go, any thoughts on, on that element? Like for you, even as you were studying or as you think about how folks might blend audio into other contexts and other use cases, uh, any thoughts on that? Yeah, everyone learns differently, right? Everyone's got their own ways of learning. But for me, I, I would have really loved audio is, is like the supplement. And for a lot of, like we we're talking about, a lot of times when I was doing work where my ears were free, but my eyes were not. So yeah, with that said, I think there's some things that audio is better for just naturally, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Talking about the psych-social section, which is a lot of psychology, sociology. I think it's 
probably the best for that. On the other hand, there's some things that are really hard to explain over audio. Anatomy is a great example, right? You can explain all the anatomy in the world that you want, but in the end, you need to have that picture in front of you. You need to understand it. So there's some things that are naturally better about audio, but yeah, I think one thing that people need to keep in mind is everyone learns differently and you can supplement the audio course, the MCAT Go with other things, you know, yeah. and there are times when I say, you know, if, if this explanation isn't working for you, just do a quick Google search to see what this actually looks like mm -hmm. um, so that you can understand it better as we go forward through this uh, yeah. lesson. So yeah, I think it's just different person by person. Yeah. And by now my listeners are going to be, be tired of me talking about playing miniature golf in VR, but my wife got me an Oculus for my birthday last year, I barely used it, but then I started playing mini golf with the Oculus and I was like, this actually works. So walkabout studios, mini golf this is a free host read for you. Thank how does you. that work? Do you have like a putter? How, that, how do you hit, get the that, resistance against the golf? Like, you, you don't, oh, you don't. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You don't good. Yeah. It's not, it's not all the way there, but there's one where you're, you're in like candy land. It's got Sade playing in the background and you're kind of like putting around. And there's another one that's like a Gothic castle. They're very interesting. They're designed interesting. by. Yeah, designed by X Theme Park, a Disney guy, you know, who was super cool building the, the theme parks. These emerging formats are really interesting and thinking about how, if the audio is great, could it be put in other contexts? The one that I keep coming to, by the way, we're in the Imagineering phase of the <laughs> conversation now. So this is where we talk about more what's capturing your imagination and what might be interesting that's coming down the pike. You know, another topic I've talked about a couple of times on the show is the memory palaces and the method of loci and the idea that memory when put into uh, a sense of place the, the the recollections can be deeper another element of that is also immersive audio for those of us who had the opportunity to see the bowie exhibit that was touring it, it was really amazing because it was contextual audio where you could almost, you know, you would see uh, a display or a Bowie costume and then you walk towards it and the music would start to get louder. So it was almost like uh, oral uh, wayfinding in, in the museum, which was really cool. Lots of new stuff emerging. Sam, I know you're busy because you're in medical school, but you're still, you're, I'm sure you're thinking about what's in the world or, around you. And, and then similarly, you know, Clara, that's a big part of leading a product team is trying to get some of that creativity and that vision from what's coming outside. What's out there in the world around you that's capturing your imagination that you think might be, we talked a lot about audio, feel free to go deep on audio if, if that's really what's got you excited these days. But I'm always curious what, even outside of education, what's out there that's capturing your imagination that folks who care about the future of learning should be tuned into? Oh my God, it is such a really intriguing world, I would say, in technology and education right now. I, I think the way that I'm trying to think about it um, and the way we're thinking about it at Med School Coach is to start with needs that aren't being met and then think about how these emerging technologies could address those needs. A huge one is like accessibility uh, related to cost, right? So, so one thing that med school coach does is we uh, will take students on trips, medical trips to Ghana or other countries and observe medical procedures there and obviously get to really experience the culture and that sort of thing. And th those trips are really expensive, right? So the vast majority, I would say, of students don't necessarily have that kind of money to put in. One thing that I'm personally very excited about is VR opening up those, those sort of experiences. So a student mm. could actually be standing in on a surgery mm. from their room and, and actually have that sort of same mm. experience. And similarly, like a classroom, I think not all learning has to take place in a classroom, certainly. You know, tutoring is expensive. The best instructors are, are expensive. And if you in a world where everyone has an Oculus or everyone has VR that's more accessible, you could experience those instructors more easily. So I'm very interested in that. I also would say even some sort of more text-based or code-based, I guess, um, innovations are really appealing to me. Like one thing that's not being done very well in a lot of test prep is better like adaptive diagnostics, right? Like adaptive testing has been around forever, but even for the MCAT, it, it really doesn't exist. Like they have a really good, as short, as concise as possible, like diagnostic that could actually save someone like five hours of tutoring time or even two hours of tutoring time. And then by, by doing that, we actually make tutoring more accessible. So that's the sort of mm -hmm. thing that I think about a lot. Interesting. 
Yeah, you hit on some elements of Web3, which is good. I always play Web3 bingo on these episodes these days. I, I led you there too, you know, AR, VR, <laughs> and AI. And then Sam, to run the table, you need to talk about the blockchain now. But uh, <laughs> no, no pressure, no pressure. No, but what's what's out there in, in your neck of the woods? What's capturing your imagination? Yeah. So I'm, I'm going to go with, I'm an audio guy. I'm going to go with audio. Something I've been thinking about recently is just the use of audio in medical education. And I'm not talking about completely all of medical education. I'm talking more about like the sounds that you hear in medicine. Diagnostically speaking, uh, the things that are really important are lung sounds, heart sounds. You can listen to the sound that blood makes as it's going through vessels. There's all these sounds that are super important and there's distinct sounds, right? You can hear a, a certain type of murmur for this disease, another type of murmur for this disease. If there's fluid in the lungs, it sounds one way, but <laughs> we're told that these sound different in our lectures, but then we don't really get to hear what they actually sound like. Yeah. So they'll say, okay, this sounds, this is a holosystolic heart murmur. And then they don't really tell us what it sounds like. And if they do have a recording, it's recorded from a potato and during the great depression or something It just sounds horrible. And that's something that I've been thinking about is, you know, why are there not better tools for learning about these sounds and learning about, you know, what they really sound like and what they sound like in different patients and getting to know those a little bit better. So that's something I'm thinking about. I haven't done anything with it, but it's something that definitely is in my mind. Yeah, that's really interesting because you do think about how we're always wearing AirPods or something in your ears. You know, I have been hearing more and more about cochlear implants and implants in your ear that can then ultimately be tied to like the equivalent of voice controls. This gets pretty interesting. This basically says we become cyborgs by virtue of, you know, our AirPods going just a little bit further in there just to get your wheels turning. But the other element is you can frequently just have audio along for the ride. So the idea that while you're listening to a lecture, if you had your AirPods in, when the murmurs are being discussed, you could hear them in real time because yeah. the other thing is frequently when then you go to try to understand what something sounds like it's separated from the initial context in which it was delivered assuming you still make the connection it's deeper processing that's probably better but i think the idea of you know even the example of the bowie exhibit like when you're studying different elements certain sounds can be incorporated into them yeah. to, to kind of put you in that context any thoughts on either the, the cochlear? I want to hear first your thoughts on, on the, the implants, Sam. Any, anything there? I'm, I'm ready. Just pl plug me in. I'll turn into iRobot. Honestly, I think that's where we're headed, right? Is implants that you know, improve your hearing, improve your eyesight. Elon Musk is working on that brain thing right now. Yeah, Neuralink. Yeah. Yeah, Neuralink. And who knows if that's going to turn it into anything big. But I think that's certainly where we're headed. Yeah. Cool. We're headed towards conclusion here. Lots to chew on and lots to think about. The other element that we didn't really even get into is how much audio, well, really speech and text are becoming similar formats as well, where, you know, I'm a lot of my books now I listen to, and some of those trends are, are super interesting. Before we wrap up, I always like to get some closing thoughts, closing comments from each of you. You could reinforce stuff that we've already talked about. You could freestyle, you could do whatever you'd like, but any concluding thoughts? Yeah, I just want to say, I think this is a really exciting time in education in general and MCAT education specifically. You know, I mean, one thing that we've seen in other test prep markets is the sort of explosion of talent, of like resources onto the scene that like dramatically cuts price. We see that in LSAT, you used to have these $2,000 courses that were king, and now you can you get the same value for much less. I think the same thing is, is ripe or the MCAT is ripe for that sort of change as well. These technologies that we've been talking about, I think will only help. And then 20 years from now, we'll have better doctors. So yeah, something to look forward to. Yeah. And they will be training in VR and <laughs> you know, there'll be implants. Sam, concluding thoughts? Yeah. I'll, I'm actually going to comment on what you just said. And that's that some of our learning actually is in VR. They've come up with this cool system for anatomy where you can actually go in and it's, you can't do it very often, but you can go in and see three-dimensionally what an organ looks like and you can move it around and take slices of it and stuff. That, those technologies are coming. Mm -hmm. uh, they're coming soon. But, mm -hmm. you know, I, I'd kind of re reiterate what Claire was saying and just say, I think audio is is a great format for learning and something that I think is going to keep growing into the future. And hopefully it gets more and more incorporated into uh, medical education. And I think there's plenty of ways that 
it could be incorporated better. It's honestly, I'm speaking from my own experience. I think probably schools do it differently depending on what med school you go to, but I definitely think there's an opportunity for schools to do it better. Awesome. Fantastic stuff. Clara Gillen and Sam Smith from Med School Coach. A new product out called MCAD Go and the MCAD Basics podcast is where you can hear Sam for free talking about yep. concepts. I found it to be a kind of entertaining listen and I'm not even preparing for the MCAT <laughs> to the best of my knowledge. Thank you to both of you for joining. Wonderful conversation. And yeah, Mike, thanks for having yeah. us. We really appreciate it. Awesome. And for our listeners, hopefully you enjoyed what you're hearing. If you did, Share the good word, write a review. We love reviews. We love folks loving us. We'll be back again soon. This is Trending in Education. 